Day two, here we go. So excited to see everybody here. Uh, my name is Karim Rahamtula. I'm the managing director for Artscape Daniels Launchpad. Big welcome to everybody that's in here today for this amazing day on music. As your MC, it's an absolute great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, as some of you know, Launchpad actually started construction 18 months ago, and it's amazing that we have our first major activation in the space to be open house. It's an exciting day to see so many of us around today to explore creativity and look at where how to break boundaries within it with everybody that's here today. Yesterday's conversation on visual identity was really interesting, and today it's about music. Um, and starting with the conversation on breaking through in the music industry to House Live tonight. It's all about music and it's gonna be a great day. Yesterday's exploration on visual identity brought together panelists to talk about the challenges and how we perceive identity and what's next in our own and our brands, the work we work with, identity. The questions from the audience at the end of the conversation were real and needed. And I think we're looking forward to what comes up today. Toronto has been waiting for this. And I want to personally acknowledge the vision and perseverance of Lamar Taylor in bringing all this together. We've been working on this for 18 months, and his drive, his passion, has really brought us together here today for Open House. So to Lamar, thank you. I don't think this journey of amazement is going to end, and I'm surely looking forward to what's next. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the communities who first inhabited the land where Launchpad sits. We would like to acknowledge the diversity of the first peoples of this area, known as the Tokaranto, and honor the stewardship of the Huron Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Um, I'd like to introduce team Tim Jones, he's CEO of Artscape, just to say a couple of words, and then we'll get going. Hi, everyone. How ever, how's everyone doing today? Pretty, come on, everybody. Do it up. <clears throat> so we're really thrilled, as Krim said, to, to welcome you here today. Uh, this, is, this project, Artscape Daniels Launchpad, has been 12 years in the making. We did it to help creative people make more money and to plug into the tools, the resources, the equipment and support that you need to prosper. How many people in the house are members already of Launchpad? Amazing. For those of you who aren't members, uh, you should know that you can apply to become a member here. Uh, you pay a monthly membership fee from $50 to $125 and that gets you shared access to all kinds of amazing equipment from fashion and textiles jewelry and leather making, digital, digital media uh, lab with recording facilities. There's also uh, 3D printing and prototyping, wood shop, all kinds of stuff. So if you haven't checked it out, after today's event, please wander the halls, check it out, talk to our technicians. Uh, please join us at Launchpad. We're here to help you uh, make it easier to do what you do as creatives. So thank you, and also a shout out to Lamar and Ahmed, to Abel for all your work, your, your dedication. These guys are in demand all over the world, and they've decided to kind of make this, uh, you know, spend 18 months, two years of the last, the last two years kind of making this happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you for giving back to this community. <laughs> One final shout out to Mitchell Cohen and Tom Dutton from Daniels Corporation. They're our major donors, our lead donors here. 
They helped build this place and they're amazing partners. So shout out to them as well. <laughs> and now back to Krim. So I think it's time to get this going, uh, get the conversation going. And I'd like to introduce the visionaries behind House, Lamar Taylor and Ahmed Ismail, Thank who have really you, brought you. us Thank here you. together for this inc incredible gathering of global creatives. Thank you. How's everyone feeling? Good? Sorry about the delay. Um, we had a speech yesterday. I'm not really going to repeat myself again, but I'll say this. This was a tweet 18 months ago, and the fact that we have 600 people in the space right now about to witness the opening of the space and just really about to embark on this journey with us. You know, I'm a high school dropout. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be teaching curriculum, you know? Uh, but the fact that everyone in this room is taking that chance and a leap of faith with me, I really appreciate that. So thank you. I just want to thank my XO family for being able to say, you know, before we even had this on paper, we have this big idea and going on a 125 city world tour. Can I bring this to your attention now? And they're like, come on, just come on the back room, build this. We got you. So Sal, Abel, you know, Lamar, Cash, every single one of you guys, I appreciate how much you guys have invested in this project. Um, we all come from, and I can speak on everybody's behalf, we come from nothing, you know. So for us to be able to be in a situation to give back, it was personal, and it's still personal, and we want to grow this with you. House is for everybody. It's an open platform. We want to see creative succeed. We want to create a sur surplus of creative talent. We want to bring the message of Canadian creatives around the world and, and make sure that we're always going to be known as a world-class city after we're all here. So thank you guys for supporting. Thank you guys for coming. And let's, let's get this party started. I want to make sure that our, you know, you guys spend more time listening to our panelists and our moderators because they flew all over the world for this. We have 22 countries in the building right now, so give everybody a round of Please applause. Please give a big round of applause for them. Um, so we're going to bring in everybody, um, all the panels and moderator can come in. Um, we have Swiss Beats, one of my favorite inspirations, who leading this. One more round of applause, y'all. Let's get busy. Give it up, give it up, give it up. Don't stop, don't stop. Let's go, keep this clapping, don't stop. For. This is what y'all here for. What y'all here for. Showtime. Woo! Showtime. Zone, 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 zone. How everybody feeling today? Nah, that's not enough. How everybody feeling today? It's an uh, it's an honor to be a part of this amazing experience. It's an honor to be sitting in front of all of you. It's an honor to be on this panel with my fellow panelists and what EXO is doing, the EXO House. This is something real major. The culture need this, and this is just the beginning of a lot of great things. So once again, a round of applause for EXO House. So we're going to start with all my panelists introducing your names so the room can get uh, familiar with you guys, even though I, think, I know you know everybody on the stage, I hope. But um, we're going to start with you, fella. I'm OPN, check, check. Uh, also known as 102.0 Tricks Point Never. I'm Halsey. I don't have a cool code name. That's it. Just Halsey. I'm Cash. I'm Wonder Girl. Yeah, I'm Wonder Girl. That's Wonder Girl. I'm Wonder Girl. <laughs> I'm Boy Wonder. I'm Mustafa. So I'm going to start with um, one question. The first question, and this is, this is a very important one because when you're coming up and you're being creative, there's a lot of different opinions. There's a lot of people that like to tell you what you can't do. Of course, you're gonna show them what you could do. Um, but this goes to anyone on the panel. How do, you how do you stay true to your craft without compromising to get to the next level? We're going in order? Nope, just. Well, 
staying true to your craft um, without compromising going to the next level for me is just doing what I love. And, and, you know, there's a lot of opportunities thrown at you. It doesn't mean that you should just take any and every opportunity. Just do stuff that's, that makes you happy and, and, and things that you think are positive and have a positive outlook. And I think it's just good for you to just stay in tune with what you're doing and stay true to yourself. That's really what it's about. So uh, that's how I stay in tune. So. Yeah, I agree. I think that you know, part of being a creative um, or part of wanting to put anything into the world, um, you need to have, be a good vessel. Like, you're a vessel. You have this opportunity and this gift to effectively change the matrix. Like, what you do changes people's lives. So you need to know yourself before you start making art so that you have a strong instinct and a strong compass you can follow. Nine times out of 10, when you meet some like washed up artists or some washed up business person whose shit just fell apart, you say, what happened? What went wrong? And they're like, I just listened to everyone else and I didn't trust my gut. But when you meet someone who's blown the hell up and they have their shit together and you say, how did you get here? How did you do it? Nine times out of 10, they'll look at you and they'll say, I trusted my gut but you need to have a strong gut and a strong sense of self so that you can rely on that compass, I think. Yeah, yeah that's very true. I think, let's give it up for Halsey. Uh, I always play this really simple game when I'm listening back to something I just made or I'm presented with an opportunity to, to collaborate. I always imagine that I'm not me and I'm just hearing it in like an Uber or whatever. And would I think that was actually really good? Or would I be excited or somehow um, just amped on it, like without any other thought? And that's what you have to do throughout your whole career, is you have to kind of bring it down, turn the temperature down, imagine yourself as all of your friends, as all of your neighbors, and imagine uh, if what you're doing is actually hot or not, you know, that way. Because there's a lot of other th things that can interfere with that. I feel it's really important too to work with like people that you believe in and they believe in in you, and that you're not scared to say what's on your mind and they're not scared to tell you what's on their mind. Just and you guys have that equal respect and belief in each other. I think also people are able to uh, trace when you're not being authentic. You know, it's uh, you know people underestimate humans all the time just because we don't understand technicality of music. We can, also, we can always trace a feeling. And um, if the feeling isn't coming through, people are gonna know that you're not, you're not being genuine. And, uh, and, and that's just what it is. So staying true to yourself, it's the only way to really cut through in whatever you're doing, in whatever medium. Yeah. Okay, good, okay. <laughs> I'm just making sure, just making sure. So um, the next question is, what is your opinion of today's state of the culture? Where do you feel that the culture is at now? I feel it's great. I think it's better than it's ever been. A lot of people are more comfortable with just being, them th just being themselves, not trying to be like, even with artists, not trying to be like a gimmick or be something that they feel is like a trend right now or like a record label has planned for them. A lot of artists right now. And today's day, especially like in urban music, if you look at the charts, the Hot 100, Seven out of those ten records have urban your artists guys on too, it. Right? Huh? Your guys on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Try to stay on there. <laughs> but like, just being yourself is just like. So I think that's really important. That's good for the culture because everybody's just open and being them, whatever they are, wherever they're from. Like even in Canada, like ten years ago, people. You guys might not, not, not know this, but if you would have walked in a room 10 years ago to a record label or to an a r and told them, I'm from Canada, I'm from Toronto, they'll look at you like, uh, all right, where's the guy from Brooklyn at? We're from the Bronx, you know? Like, <laughs> but now it's cool to be from Canada. Shout out to Canada. Yeah, I, th I personally think it's in a great state with like streaming and everything that's going on. It's almost like the fans and the real people that really actually love the music get to decide what's hot. You know, whereas before it was programmed and like kind of chosen for you, I think with the streaming services and everything else, it's a lot in the fans' hands and, and the listeners. So um, I think it's in a beautiful place as well and it's just gonna get better and, and a lot of people are just doing them and just being themselves. So I, I love it. I love where music's at right now and the culture's at. 
I think like what you said about streaming culture goes back to what Mustafa said about like people being able to see through right now because like social media and streaming platforms have given this like this effect of like pulling back the curtain where like when I was growing up and I was listening to like Britney Spears who I still love by the way but like I saw what her record company wanted me to see everything was an editorial photo shoot everything was an organized interview there wasn't iPhones and Twitter and Instagram Live and social media for her to like really connect and give me a sense of who she is. So now because of that accessibility that we have to artists and to creatives, it makes a more intelligent audience. And it makes an audience that's like, we don't want an authentic, we want authenticity. We want something real because we can see right through you all the time. We can see where you are, what you're doing. And if something doesn't add up, we're gonna notice because we have an eye on you always. And so because of that, they're starting to say, we don't want you to tell us what we like anymore. We're gonna figure it out for ourselves. And we're gonna do that through playlisting and through streaming and you know the ability to have a nuanced taste in music and to say, I feel like listening to this right now, and now I feel like listening to this, because we're not popping CDs in the freaking boom box anymore, having to listen to the same 15 tracks. We can bounce around and find people who speak to us in individual ways. You just need a six disc changer, House. <laughs> okay, I didn't have it like that the back trunk. then, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I also right. want to say that I don't necessarily, I'm not looking at the culture as ultimately good or ultimately bad. I think that right now we're just experiencing a shift. Yeah. You know, it's, we're nearing the end of the decade, so everything's gonna overturn. People are gonna fall off, See. and um, yeah, we're gonna turn a new leaf, right? That's, that's, important. that's important that you said that, because my thing is, with all of the new opportunities and everything happening in music, how much of it do you really care about, right? So we say the music culture um, is at a great space, but how much are you really loving and how much you really care about with so much out there that's not really um, being curated and some people are just using it as a wave and not as a craft. Um, and so how does that work? You know, with, of course, we love where the music culture is, but it's important for us to continue shaping that culture because you can have a place where, I'm not saying that one shouldn't express themselves, express how you feel on all formats. But you know, this is something where it's less, it's less quality than actual you know, uh, greatness, right? And, and do you feel, in, 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 the, in the hands of the people in this room, uh, if you feel that the quality of music that you're listening to is not on the level of the music you want to listen to, raise your hand. That's, that's good. That's good. Well, I feel the same way. Um, so as creators on this stage, how do you be a part of the ecosystem and setting the tone to continue to add more greatness uh, through your arts in the world? I think just like- She uh, spoke! <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just like bringing something new, always, yeah. I, I think. And that's what I try to do all the time. You do? For sure. Yeah, basically just thinking outside of the box for me. And um, when I see stuff going one way, I like to, you know, go the other way, especially with music and, and like production. And also, like, I love to just, you know, dabble back into my past and stuff that I used to enjoy and kind of like incorporate it into what's going on right now for, because, you know, not everybody has the same experiences. But really with music, I just try to bottle my experiences and, and put it out there. And uh, show everybody what like music that I used to like, incorporate it in new music that I do, and just keep an open mind uh, to new music that's going on and a anything really, really, really and truly. So, so I have an anecdote about Wonder Girl actually that's relevant. Then the first time I met you, you were in London and you were in a Twig session. So I imagined that we were there to make music together. But when I asked you, you said, "No, I'm just going to observe." And it was like the first time you were in that situation. I said, well, how do you usually make music? And you said, I make beats and I email my beats to whoever needs it. And that is true for many people. But what's not true is the decision to then go into a studio and observe and sit and learn and, and absorb this new thing. Whether or not it's interesting to an artist is another conversation. But 
putting yourself out there and putting yourself in that situation where you're addressing the craft, I think is something that's overlooked these days. I think everyone knows that we have access to all this technology and we have access to every recorded thing ever made and, and it's all out there. And, and to break those systems and to, and to use those histories in interesting ways, we have to understand them. We can't just go in saying we're all super unique and we're all individual and gonna do everything we want. In my opinion, going into an alien, an unfamiliar situation, old school situation, figuring out what that's about is also valuable in finding your own voice. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pop artist. So like a lot of times what I do kind of gets like discredited or invalidated because it's like, oh, you make pop music, but I'm a writer. I've, I've, every song I've ever put out, I wrote. And I think that when you're creating a consciousness, like a collective consciousness that people, you know, everyone who's listening to your music at some point is tapping into the same frequency that you're at when you're making it. Mm -hmm. And like, I think when it comes to affecting the culture and it comes to what our role is, it's like, as a creative, there's two things you can be. There's creatives who make music that distracts people from what's going on in life. Music that takes them out of it and music that lets them escape or any kind of art or medium that lets them escape. And then there's the kind of creative who makes art that forces people to reflect and to have to pay attention to what's going on and says, I'm not taking you out of it, I'm putting you in it. And neither is more important than the other. They're both equally important to what it means for this creative consciousness, but you need to decide which one you're gonna be. Are you taking an opportunity to create an escape for someone, or are you making them wake up and, and pay attention to what's going on? Which kind of artist are you? Definitely, I think um, the main thing from what everyone is saying is, don't be scared to take the risk. If you wanna change the game, you have to enter something that hasn't exist yet. You know, everyone on this stage took a risk and I've been taking a risk all my life so much that I broke my arm and I was <laughs> on some skates. But, um, you know, uh, everyone take the risk. Don't be scared because a lot of people turned down my music many times um, because it was different. You know, don't be afraid to be different. You might be way ahead of everyone that's telling you that it's not hot or that it's not it. Like, stay on your vision. If you believe it in your heart, stay on your vision, stay on your course. Now, um, what's the importance of business, of knowing business and music? Really important, so you don't get a bad deal. You know? <laughs> There's a lot of artists like that. I'm, I have a few artists that are great friends of mine. They got great music. They're music's on the charts, selling out shows, but they're not really making what they're supposed to make because they signed a bad deal at a young age and being eager, you know? The first advice I give to everybody is find a music lawyer, they'll help you. Make sure it's your lawyer, not the label or whoever's yeah. trying to sign you as a lawyer. Now, do you think that's the right steps, find a music lawyer, or, or should every person that's wanting to be an artist do their own homework first and find out about the business that you want to be in so when you go to your lawyer, definitely. you can have a real conversation. Yeah, so educate yourself. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. yes. And with the internet now, it's super easy. Yeah. Yeah, don't ever let anybody catch you slipping in that way. Like, when you start out, if you don't understand something, educate yourself about it. I know, like, when I first started, like, getting in studios, I had never been in front of a desk in my life. I was writing songs in my bedroom and, like, recording them in the garage band. Um, and so I started talking to people and people would like write you off or they'd be like, I got this, I'm gonna do this. I got the production part, I got that. And I said, no, no, none of that. I'm gonna educate myself on this so I can sit down and say, here's exactly what I want and if you can't do it, I'm gonna do it for myself. And it was the same thing when you start getting into like, you know, the business portion of things is I remember sitting down with my lawyer and saying, teach me what this means. What are points? What's a back end? What's 360? What does all this mean? So when someone says to me, don't worry, Ashley, you're 18. We'll deal with this. I can say, no, 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 no. I want to know what I'm getting myself into and what I'm signing myself up for. And there was a lot of times when I caught shit in a deal or in, you know, whatever it was and had to say, 
get rid of that. I don't want that. And if I hadn't educated myself, I wouldn't have been able to. Like, surround yourself with good people, but remember that you got to look out for yourself first because people Facts. will try to screw yeah, you. Man. It is a business. Not cash. Yes, yep. yes, yes. Um, I was like really cynical, how, sorry. <laughs> how many people in this room uh, want to be in the music business or make music? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. Well, it goes, the business part goes for anything creative. Art business, music business, fashion business, TV business. Notice all of those things have the word business attached to it. And us as creatives, we have to take the power back and stop letting the business people take advantage of us because we don't know the business and, and we're the talent and they know our worth. But the key to success is, is everybody knowing their worth. Now, Cash, how many... Um, percent that you would say of the artists in the industry that people see every day don't really have what they say they have because of bad because of not knowing their business about what percent 90 <laughs> you agree one trillion percent and this is why the business part is super important like imagine you're putting all this work in all this time you come into panels you know it's this is your baby this is your life and you're just giving it away because you don't want to take the time out to uh, learn the business, but you want to be on Instagram, or you want to take the time out to learn a program, just take that same time out to learn the business, because if you learn the business, you will forever be in power. Your music can come and go, but if you have the business mindset, you can always reset your button. That's why I'm here from 70, uh, 98 to 2018. It, it's not because of my records, it's because of being able to have a business plan and be business-minded when you hot or you cold. The business is important. Thank you. Now, I see, I'm passionate about that part because I can't take it no more. <laughs> I can't. You survived. <laughs> We're still surviving, man. It's the, sh the water's full of sharks. Look out the window, you know? Man, you know, they're coming to eat the creators up alive and we got we to gotta change it, you know? Um, leading into that, what does success mean to you? True success. Anybody? <laughs> everybody wants to I mean, be successful. I, I feel like everybody's like definition of success is completely different, but mine is like um, just being able to complete all the goals that I have, and you know, be on top of you know where I want to be, being exactly where I want to be. That's it. So you said something good, goals. Why is it important to have goals? Because like, where are you going to get without goals? Like, well, how do you know what you want to do if you don't have goals? But you, you, you'd be surprised how many people don't have goals. Yeah, it's, I'm actually, yeah, I know. Because <laughs> I, I, like, I've been telling people like, this whole year, like, just set goals, like, you know? It's very like, important. If you want to get somewhere, make that list and figure out what you're going to do to get there. Because it's possible. Very possible. Everybody make goals. Make your list because you're going to eventually get what you want, right? But then when you get what you want and don't know what to do with it, you're going to lose it, and then you got to figure it out again. But if you have a goal, like, listen, when I place this first song, the money that I get from that, I'm going to do this. And keep building from your goals. Like, you have to know your destination in order to travel. You're not just going to get on a plane and just let it fly. You have to know I'm going to, you know, Toronto, right? So make sure you... Know your goals and, and set your tone for yourself. Get okay, cash. For me, I measure success based, based on how happy like, my family is. Dude. Most importantly, just being able to see my family whenever I can and making sure I cover all their needs and whatever they need, seeing them happy, and my friends, because my friends are my family. So anybody I work with, anybody that's around me, I want to just, for me, I measure on, on their level of happiness. If they're happy, I'm happy, I'm doing something right. My mom waking up in the morning, calling me only with good calls. We're good. We're successful. That's blessings. I think I would, on Cash's point, uh, sorry about that. No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think on Cash's point, uh, my idea of success is also happiness. Um, and for me, happiness derives from peace. And um, I don't necessarily believe that there's um, in, in, uh internal peace here or like a, a like a an eternity and peace in this life so my happiness comes from doing things for the sake of god you know 
And like when I leave it to God, that to me is eternity and that's what eternal happiness looks like because I think that every joy that exists on this earth is temporary and it's conditional. So if I'm doing it for the sake of God, that's where my eternity and my legacy lies. That's what happiness is. I've seen some depressed billionaires before. I'm sure you have too. Huh? I, I've seen some depressed billionaires before. I'm sure. Yeah, you know, that's true. But a little bit of that is good. I actually, I, th I think I'm in, I, I concur with you, Mustafa. It's like success to me is paradoxical because on one hand, success is like a lack of stress, right? If I'm, if I'm not stressed out and I'm content, I'm in the moment and I'm just enjoying life, that's success. But on the other hand, as an artist, as we all can probably relate to, that stress also feeds you. And, and, a, and, a, and too much contentment is not really good for our business. Like, it's not who we are. So it's a delicate balance. You don't want, want to be um, kind of restless forever and, and, and drive yourself crazy just for this art. But at the same time, you don't want to get too comfortable either because uh, it, changes, uh, it changes that feeling of the, the pure feeling of success that goes away, that sort of enjoyment of family or just the being in the moment. Uh, you know, that relies also on you staying really hungry and creative, creative and, 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 and dreaming, which requires work. It's exhausting to dream, you know? It's, an ex it's even more hard to make it a reality. So, you know, thank you, Lamar. Yeah, you know Michelle Lamar. <laughs> No more dreams. Look, uh, so I knew that everyone was going to answer the question like that. But what is real music success? Music success. Music success to me, like going back to the goals, is just like dreaming and just accomplishing your goals. And always, and even with me as well, it's elevation for with, with everybody that's around you, not just yourself. You know, like my team, I want everybody to be elevated around me. Everybody who helped me come up. I want to figure out ways to help them come up and all just work together and have like a bunch of success, like a successful team. And it's just not fun to win by yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want to see everybody around me winning as well. And that's success to me. And uh, as for music, um, success is just like getting to where you want and making the best music you could possibly make. Like I want to inspire people with my music. It's not just um, a thing for me where it's like, oh yeah, I want to make money and, and get rich. I want to inspire people with my music. I want people to hear my music and it influence them and them get better at their music as well. But what was the first time that you knew you were successful? Uh, success, the first um, time I felt success was hearing my song on the radio like constantly. Um, what song was that? It was Best I Ever Had by, by Drake. And, um, you know, thank you. And, um, Thank you. You know, uh, I, I spent a lot, at that time I was in Toronto a lot, and you know, I never really left the city, never really been anywhere, and I'd hear the song on the radio, and I'd be like, yeah, it's cool, they're gonna play it out here, but when I really went to like New York, and I heard it being played constantly in Atlanta and LA, my first time going to these places, I was like, wow, this song is really, it's really out there, you know? Like I didn't, at that time the internet was just booming, so it's like you can't really base it off anything, it's just I kept hearing the song everywhere, and, and people were just reaching out to me, so. That was the beginning of success for me. So. Blessings. I think like being an artist is like, it's just like, it's so, it's so meta because we do this thing where we take a reflection of ourselves and we manifest it into a physical thing and then we give people the power to say, I like this or I don't like this, which means in a way, essentially, it's like they're saying to you, I like you or I don't like you because the thing they're judging is a manifestation of like your soul. Like it's a reflection of who you are. Like you've put all of yourself into this record someone's gonna buy for $12.99 at Target. Like that's you on that shelf there. There's your existence. And if someone doesn't like it, it can hurt. But I think the thing about like judging, judging that success is knowing like, you can look at something that you've made and say, that's still me. I'm still proud of that. I still, I still stand by that. Um, and like me being a musician, it's like, because it's so personal and it's, it's so, it's so deeply ingrained in, in your identity, like a bad day at the office for a musician isn't like, Oh, my boss yelled at me. And like, I have a ton of work to do. It's like, 
people hate my whole existence. Like, like you're like having an existential crisis when you have a bad day at work as an artist because it's, you're having your existence judged. And that can be really hard to get through. But I think that when you can like overcome that and supersede that and look at your art and be like, that's still me, that's still a reflection of who I am, I stand by that, that's a really good way to measure your success is to be like, what is your job as an artist? Is it to make art or is it to make headlines? You know, your job is to make art. And if you can look at your art and be proud of it, you're doing your job. And that's, that's that. Yes. But um, I always hear a lot of people say, after they're successful, um, that it's not about the money, it's not for the money, nothing's for the money. How, when does it get to the point when it's not for the money? Well, well <laughs> it's always a little bit about the money, right? Uh, no, I think as a, I don't know, as a somebody that makes, you know, for a long time I was making, like largely making instrumental music and it was kind of free form music. It, was, it wasn't really for the money. But even on that level, I remember like I would make my tapes, I would walk to the post office in Bushwick and I would send them direct mail to all these people that emailed me. You know, I was running a little mom and pop shop and people bought this stuff. And I knew people who were trying to do the same thing and some of them sold more tapes than me and some of them sold less. And you, you, would, you would judge yourself that way too. I think denying that or pretending that's not part of it at any level you're at is a little bit um, um, fake. But that said, music is music. And music, to me, is like when you get chicken skin and when the hair stands up on your, on your neck or on your arms and you have that thing that you can't explain that just happened to you because of sound, because of a melody, because of this collection of, of, of strange things that you just heard that just triggered you and your body can't control it. So that to me is success. When I do that for somebody else, when I give that to someone else or I give that to myself through my own music, which is even harder, right? And you just feel like you've, you know your craft, you've done something, even if it's, if it's magic, it's not at this point, you know? It's like, it's actually causing people to feel something, so. But you're going off the money part. Let's talk about the money. When, when, when is, yes, let's talk about the money. So, okay, again, this is a business. We're talking about a business, right? And the way that someone explained it to me in the beginning, it's like a really silly metaphor, but it's a really, really good one. It's like, all right, say that you own a farm, right? And you grow berries and your family makes this like homemade jam. And it's like the best jam in the world. Like everyone fucks with your jam. They love it. It's so good. Um, you put your heart into it. You're in the kitchen cooking it up every day, like putting your heart and soul into it. And someone comes along and they say, we really, really like this jam. We're going to start selling it in these stores. And you're like, fire. I'm going to make all this money. People are going to eat my jam that I'm making. And they start putting it in stores. And then people really start to like it and people start talking about it, and they're coming from all over to see it and to buy it, and then someone comes up to you and they say, Walmart wants to buy um, your jam, <laughs> and they want to distribute your jam. And you're like, this is sick, oh my God, Walmart's gonna sell my jam? All right, everyone's gonna buy it. And then they say to you, but here's the problem, is if we're gonna put it in Walmart, you can't make it at home anymore because you're not gonna be able to, <clears throat> you're not gonna be able to sustain with the demand. So we're gonna move it to a factory and have someone else make your jam for you. You're making a lot of money, but it's not your fucking jam anymore. So then what's the point? So it's like, that's kind of the way that I see it. You're you in a jam. Yo, cash, you walk that that's what I wanted to get to. Cash should be answering yes, the question about the cash, man. Huh? Come on, bro. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. Let's go. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get the, His name is Cash. You understand? Like, <laughs> Look, I didn't name myself, okay? There's a guy named Hawk. He's blamed for this. I don't know where he is, but yeah, his fault. No, so, so Cash. Because um, when I asked what is it about the money, you, you said a bunch of different things. Um, but when you're going for a deal, are you trying to get the most money as possible? Definitely. And I call that guy right there, Sal. <laughs> you see, the money guy is always on the side. You see this? <laughs> but, um... Well, it's with, not always about... Okay, it is about the money, but yes, you want to definitely get, like, the best out of the deal as well, too. You don't want to just sign a deal for a big amount of money and 
yeah. you know, you don't get the best for for your client, for your for for your team out of the deal by like, you know, you're giving away everything basically. You don't want to do that either. So it's not. But how do you prevent that? How do you prevent that? Yeah. By having an idea of what you want and going in there, knowing what you want, and knowing your so worth and knowing your value. Educating yourself of what you want. Yes. Just knowing it. You don't even need to educate it. You you, you don't need to. Educate yourself on what you want. You just know it in your stomach. This is what you want. This is what you feel you guys, like, we deserve. And going in there with that so attitude. If, you go, if you're a new artist and you go to a label and say you want $25 million because you feel it in your gut and that's what you deserve. They hey, if you're, if you're a new artist and you, got, and you already got your projects out there on the internet and you're already streaming $100 million on each song, you go in there with that type of attitude, you might not get that, but you're going to get close to it. Okay. If you already built it on your own. Okay. We Maybe. built EXO on our own. So yeah. we, yeah, we, we did everything on our yeah, own. Yeah, Amen. Super fast. We knew exactly what we wanted. We knew exactly what we wanted for a show. We knew exactly yeah. our, our value because we did it on our own before yeah. we went to any label or anything. And you did your homework on your own too, right? Yeah, just I don't like I don't like I know everybody here reads books. I never sat down and read a book. How am I gonna make it in the music business? Nah, I'm not saying that. Like I don't do that. I just yeah, I go with my gut. I mean, just go with our team and just go with. It's like you know what you got in front of you. You know. Definitely. Yeah, and going back to what um, Halsey was saying too, it's it's like, although yeah, it is about money and everybody needs money. It's I feel like when you put that mindset, being an artist and being a creative, when you put the money first, it takes away from the quality, which is why I said, like, you know, I always want to just make stuff to, to inspire and, and, and get better. Even now as a musician, producer, everything, I'm getting better, and I just want to get better because I feel like once you put that first, the money will always be there. Like, you know, once you put the art first and you, and you, you, you keep go. on perfecting your craft and you keep on going and try to push boundaries, the money's always going to be there. It's just about you putting in the, the hours and the time and the love for, for what you're doing. So uh, money is important, yes. Obviously, but um, I think also just like putting your craft first is very important. Yeah, like people, I feel like there's always going to be someone out there who will give you money for being exactly who you are and doing what you believe in if it's right and if it's good. So don't take the money from the person who wants to change you or wants to like mess with it because if you wait, there will always be someone else who's going to come along and say, oh, thank God you didn't go with that guy because I'm going to give you a shit ton of money for being exactly what you are. Exactly. And then you don't, like, screw yourself. Yeah, you just got to bet on yourself and just double down, you know, and, and don't, like, let anybody come in and, and try to change you for anything. Just stay true to yourself. Definitely. And the reason why I stressed the money part um, so much was because that's the entry point for people into our lives is through the financial part. You know, they come and say, listen, we want to do this deal with you, and we have all of this different money here and there, but it has to be something that's tailored to you, because sometimes you could take less money and have more success. So this is why I'm saying uh, it's important to have a gauge on what you want, right? So when a person comes to you, you automatically know what you want to do um, and, and, and lay out your plan. Uh, but for all the panelists, and we could start, I'm going to start with you, Mustafa and we can come down this way. Um, what did the come up take? Like, what was your grind? Like, what, like, what, what have you been through to, to be in this seat right here in front of all these oh, amazing I'm people? I'm still coming up, man, you know? I'm like step two, like I'm at like D, you know what I mean? If we're going like letter, like the Z is like the final level. D, E, maybe, H. I Love think um, for myself, though, it's purely been about the art. You know, I know that's, that's a cliche, but um, I started by writing poetry when I was like 12 years old only because I knew that no one cared about it at the time. They didn't know what it was. It was such a foreign concept to kids in my class. I was like grade four, grade five, and I just didn't want anyone to bother me. And I, want, I wanted to be able to confide in something because I couldn't confide in someone. And I didn't even want that something that I was confiding in to be popular because then that felt like I was exposing a relationship that I didn't want to, to be like uh, tampered with in any way because like, you know, I, I was fragile at the time. And so I continued to grow in that way and I didn't even, I couldn't even have imagined that it could grow into anything that it's grown into, you know? And um, I'd have, I had opportunities from people like, you know, 
Abel and Lamar, like that came, you know, as, as, as I started to grow. And I realized that that activism was something that people were admired, that, that people admired. But um, ultimately, there was something that moved inside of me of seeing people hurt and seeing myself hurt and reflecting that hurt in some sort of way. And uh, I tried to follow the feeling. Again, I'm still trying to trace the feeling. I don't know if I got it all the way, but um, I'm getting closer every day. That's beautifully said. You can obviously tell he's a poet. Yes, blessings. Yeah, for me, um, it started out with just a love for music. I had no idea about how to create it or anything. Like, I, I, there was just a genuine love for it. And um, I just kept going after I have no music training, no, no nothing. I just ended up uh, getting this program called FL Studio when I was in about ninth grade. And I just, I didn't know anything. There's no YouTube. There's nothing, no tutorials to show me how to use it. I was just so in love with it and so interested in it. I just turned every knob and tried to figure everything out. And, you know, um, the background I came from, I came from a Jamaican uh, family, you know, and, you know, trying to make it in music with a Jamaican is like, you know, they'd never heard of anything like that. That's novelty to them. You know, my parents come from, from poverty in, in Jamaica. So they're like, oh, you want to make music? That's, that's silly. You know, so I had a lot of... Um, you know, speed bumps with that, but it was really all about just overcoming all of that with me and um, just taking a risk because, you know, naturally I'm like an introverted person and I just had to just dive into the water, man, and, and, and just, I, I, that stuff didn't matter. I wanted to make it so badly in music. I was just like, I'm going to get over all these fears and just push through and um, that's what I ended up doing and just uh, pushing through constantly with my music until, um, you know, I ended up getting noticed out here and uh, started doing amazing work with a lot of people, so. Um, I mean, like, I guess I just really had a love for creating. Like, it wasn't even just music. Like, I loved music, but I just loved to create things. Like, I love to go on Photoshop and just, you know, make things and edit things and what's it called? Like, then I got into like, I got a keyboard and I started playing on my keyboard and realized that I could make music too. And went on the internet and like, just searched up how to do it and searched up producers. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. And then, um, what's it called? Yeah, that's, that's really how I got into it. It wasn't really, I wasn't planning on making any money for this or anything. You know, I just wanted to create, so. Um, for me, it was I always loved hip hop and R and B uh, music, and my best friend Belly was always he lived right behind my house. He would rap, so first start out just going by freestyle battles with him, and making a little bit of money off being the guy in the next neighborhood. Then from there, started selling his mixtapes. I drove around the whole country in a truck selling Belly's mixtapes in every city in Canada, going to every store. He's putting the mixtapes in it, putting up posters on every pole downtown Toronto. I put a poster on before every wall, and just from there, it just kept growing and growing, and uh, spending a lot of time in the studio. Realized I love being in the studio, just where I like to be. And from there, met Abel, met The Weeknd, met Lamar, and we just, all the dots were connected. Um, yep, we're here now. Amazing. I had like, I guess like I had really young parents. My parents had me when they were like 19 or 20. And so I grew up like basically like a welfare kid in New Jersey. <laughs> but one thing my parents always did was like always encouraged me to be creative. Like I always tell this one story about my parents got this like apartment and it was like a two bedroom apartment where like a family of five were like moving in. and. I asked my parents, I was like, can I paint the walls in my bedroom purple? And my mom and dad looked at each other in that moment, and they knew that they would lose the security deposit if they said yes. They knew the landlord wouldn't give them that money back, and they looked at me and they went, of course you can. And that was like, that's like kind of like a hallmark for that for me. It was like my parents kind of always just like let me express myself and let me be, let me be artistic at whatever cost, you know? And so I got into a studio for the first time when I was 19, and I wrote my first song ever in a studio, and it was the song that got me my record deal. 
So it was kind of just this thing that clicked. Like, it was like as soon as I did it, I knew that was what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and I think, like, having had that mentality as a kid of, like, your self-expression is always going to be more valuable than your fear or your limitations. Um, and, yeah, I just, like, I was an art major in college. I was supposed to go be a painter, which is, like, I'm super stoked I didn't do that because... I would have carpal tunnel. Um, but I, uh, I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to express myself in some way. I just hadn't found the right medium. And then as soon as I got into a studio and started writing, I was like, this is it. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I just never looked back. And I signed my deal five months later. So it was just go time. Lessons. Yeah, I think my family also had a big effect on me. I mean, they were Russian Jewish immigrants from the Soviet Union. So they weren't wanted there. They decided to leave in the 80s. And they had to escape. And they were musicians. And they, you know, very different. My, my dad was like self-taught, which is playing, you know, like rock bands, would play keyboards in rock bands. My mom was conservatory trained. She played piano and she played beautifully. And when they moved to the States, they gave that all up. But the thing that they gained when they came to the States was that they could fill the house with music. And, and this was not necessarily possible there. And, um, and so that was their gift to me. And, and that, was, that's, you know, that started it for me. And my dad kept going because he wanted to make some cash on the side. He had a keyboard, he had a Roland Juno 60 that he had all these super corny like organ patches and accordion patches and he would play these Russian tunes in these bars uh, in like Dorchester and Roxbury, Massachusetts to make a, like 50, 100 bucks extra a week. And, and I would go down in the basement, I would turn it on and I'd start like, what does this thing do? What does this thing do? And start messing around with a bender and open up the envelopes and I ruined his entire bank of sounds and he was pissed for a second but i think he also kind of realized i was like well he's he's curious and so i think that um you know that really got me going and i have them to to thank for that um and i kept using that that was that's the other thing is like you know not everybody in this room is going to have access to like all of the same equipment and all this great stuff that everyone else does but it doesn't matter. Whatever you can get your hands on, use it, learn it, master it, make your masterpieces with it, and then until you graduate to the next level with the next toy or whatever, but you don't need all that stuff. And, and that was something that always made me feel very good about my craft, was that I was always doing these crazy uh, symphonies with, with just a few basic little um, gadgets and gizmos that I could get my hands on. And, that was a source of pride for me because I'll look at the, at, at the next person over with everything, you know, and they were making like the most junk music, so. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so. Um, Your turn. Huh? Your turn. No, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, well, my grind started out in the South Bronx, uh, St. Mary's Projects, Homer Karras one. And when I would go outside, it was happening right in the back park, like the DJ battles, the rap battles, the break dancing. I was a part of a break dancing crew called GTR, Guaranteed to Rock. I was the youngest member. I think I was about five years old at that time. <laughs> you know, the jean jacket with the art on the back. So, um, you know, it just was always around me. It was always around me. Art was always around me. Music was always around me. Um, it didn't feel like something that, um, it just felt natural. It wasn't something that I seen from a window and was like, oh, I want to go there. I was actually in the middle of it. Um, and even from my dad, my dad started uh, with Cool Herc uh, in the beginning of music period. My dad never really put his name out there as far as one of the, uh, with the so-called founders of hip hop. Um, and so I had that running through my bloodline and then I wanted to be a DJ. I didn't even know about producers or 
with the with with a producer even was. I, I wanted to be like K Capri, Red Alert, Chuck Chill Out, <clears throat> Ron G, all these legendary DJs because the DJs had it on on point at those particular times. And then so I started making mixtapes, cutting hair in the barber shop at the same time. So I would cut hair underage in the barber shop, doing designs and you know all the Jamaicans' heads. <laughs> You know, because where I grew up, um, there's a lot of Jamaicans, a lot of boy wonders. What a blood clad boy. <laughs> right? No, but, um, you know, and then I started making intros for my mixtapes because back then you had to have an intro in your mixtape and you had to have a featured guest or whatever. And I didn't know I was producing, I was just making intros for my mixtape. And then my uncle said, man, you know, if you take the music, the, the vocals out, that's called producing. I was like, no, nah, I'm just looping. What are you talking about? And he's like, no, you're producing, like you're making the beat and you're doing this. I was like, no, I'm sampling and I'm looping. All right, and then um, didn't pay attention to him till about six years later, because uh, the mixtapes was going well, then I started DJing all the parties. And then um, I was also getting in a lot of trouble in, in, my, in my schools, not from an academic level, but just, um, because of where I lived, it was more territorial. So if I'm on one part of the Bronx, then you gotta go to another part of the Bronx. It was like, forget going to class. I'm trying to like, just make it to school safe and make it back home safe. And then I got caught up into the streets and then ended up kind of getting deported to Atlanta and um, started the music thing back up. And then I get a phone call from my uncles um, saying that they starting this record label called Rough Riders and I should come up for the summer. And um, went up for the summer, slept on floors. I remember having like bruises on my face, my elbow, and just everybody would go out, party with girls and different things like that. I was just addicted to the music. Um, and the rest is history. Woo! <laughs> You're good. <laughs> but, um, so we've talked about a lot of success, and we talked about um, how we start. But what was some of the, what was the main obstacle that you had to jump over? What was the major hurdle in your life, in this music, um, in your creative career that you had to jump over? And how did it change your life, and how did you overcome that obstacle? Uh, one of the main obstacles for me was just basically, um, you know, just believing in myself, you know, because I was never really around anybody that, like, thought it would be possible to make music. Like, we're from Toronto, like, literally, what, 15 years ago, it wasn't even, like, a possibility that you could make it from out here, especially doing, like, hip-hop music or R&B. There's only, like, a few guys, you know? So, um, with me, it was just mainly just having the confidence to, to, to like I said before, just power through and, and, and believe it in myself. That was a huge hurdle for me because, you know, I was around a lot of negativity coming up, but, you know, you just got to ignore that stuff, like, really what I've come to learn. And, you know, going to, like, beat battles and winning and, and stuff, that's really what helped my confidence and just being able to be like, yeah, I can do this. Like, I, I can actually do this, and it's actually possible. And, you know, you know I, I met up with other people that thought it was possible, too, and worked equally as hard, like uh, Drake and the whole whole team. We just worked together, and we just kept pushing forward and... and broke some barriers and, and, and did some cool stuff for, for the country as a whole, you know, as, as with everybody else. So um, really and truly is just really believing in myself and, and um, yeah, just, just moving forward with that. So that was like a huge obstacle for me. Believe in yourself, King. Yep, of course, always. Now I know, I, but back then I didn't know, you know. Now, now it's, it's familiar to me. So. Um. My, my largest, I think, uh, obstacle was uh, identity difficulties and like uh, identity complexities. You know, growing up, you know, growing up black Muslim from an inner city community, too black for the Muslim kids, too Muslim for the black kids, you know what I mean? And it's like, you're at home and like, that the sense of identity at home and sense of home is lost because, you know, your parents immigrated from, you know, East Africa and uh, they don't really identify or connect with the land that you're on you don't connect with the land that they come from. And so it was just constant navigation for me. And I was just trying to find my feet for a long time. And I knew that once I was rooted in my own identity, I was gonna be able to move forward with firm steps. Yeah.
Um, I mean, I think my biggest obstacle was, um, I guess, working with people and like what Wanda said, like believing in myself as well. Um, how I got over that was kind of like getting into the remix project because before the remix project, um, I was just alone in like you know working by myself in my room. So I didn't, I wasn't interested in working with anybody at all. So going in there, you were forced to kind of work with people. So and I got better at it. I think for me it was just basically making that transition from like where we come from and for like where I grew up and just that transition of like not doing everything my friends are doing that might get me into a lot of trouble even though it's so tempting and just making that and sacrificing and not going for like the fast money all my friends around me making a lot of money fast and you know and just being broke and not like getting yourself caught up in that and just making that transition of sacrificing that, sacrificing that kind of lifestyle, even a lot of friends, just to make it over here and, and focus and have your eyes on the prize, which is the music. And yeah. Being a woman, every single place I went, everybody was like, Oh, but you don't really write your own music, right? But you don't really, you're not really directing your music videos, just that you're just putting directed by because it like, makes you look better. I know, but you're not really co-producing. You're not really executive producing. But you're not really designing. You're not really, like it was some lie. Like it was like, I couldn't have possibly have been doing that on my own. There has to be some dude helping me out, right? or watching that credit kind of get handed off time and time and time again where, you know, I'd be sitting in a room and someone would walk past me to like the producer I was with and start talking to them about the song and he'd be like, nah man, that's all her. Hmm. And they'd look at me and be like, oh really? I'm like, yeah, really. And that was hard for me because I got kind of jaded at first and I kind of was just like, you know, F this, F that, like screw all these people. And like, um, I had to kind of like, down myself back because it made me really introverted and it made me really limited as a creative because I was like, well, screw all these people. I don't want to work with anyone anyway then. And then that limits you as a creative because you only have so much to draw from and you can't make everything in a vacuum. Like you need to open yourself up to the possibility of working with other people and having their experiences influence you and like put nuances in your work. And like, I remember my first real co-write that I ever did for the second album, because I had written the whole first album myself. The first real co-write I did for my second album was with a guy, and I was already like, oh, here we go. Um, and I ended up making a really cool song that I really liked and kind of loosening my grip on that a little bit and being like, look, you don't need to be like the bitchy feminist all the time, which is like a hard lesson to learn. And like being like, open yourself up to working with other people and accept that if you know the integrity of what you're doing, and you're proud of yourself as like a female in this industry making the strides that you're making. Like, that's all that matters. Um, but I still, it, I still run into it all the time. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? You, I was in a studio with someone, a pretty big producer, like a couple of weeks ago, and Mans was like, "Oh well, listen, I have, um, I have three platinum records, so like, blah blah blah." And I was like, "Bruh." I got eight. And it was just like, you know, it was one of those very patronizing moments of like, I don't know. So I think if for all the women out here who are, who are creatives, just, just stand up for yourself when the time is right, but just know when to swallow it and be like, oh, you'll see. You'll see. That's like basically it, yeah. Halsey, I think you should sit here and I'll sit over there so I can talk right before you. Because, no, no, no. no. It's, it's, it's great to hear that. I don't have much to add. I think I came up against, against like a lot of um, like kid in a, like first generation immigrant kid problems. Like as much as my parents opened me up to music, there was a limit. Like they didn't want me to have a fucked up life. Like they didn't want me to to struggle the way that they were struggling. So they, it wasn't easy for them to encourage me to have this as a career. And as, as, as that became more and more 
uh, as I got older, I got more mischievous and tricky in ways of fooling them into thinking that I was going to have a normal career while really I was going <laughs> So I think a lot of it was, was just kind of trying to balance what I knew they were right in some ways because I watched them struggle. Um, but in, in, in other ways, they just couldn't relate to me. And they didn't understand where I was coming from. They just, there, was a, there, was a, there was just differences. I was an American kid, basically, in this Russian immigrant family. So, so just that was my biggest obstacle, was trying to balance and figure out um, for my own, why am I doing this? And why am I driven to do this, even if people that I really love and respect around me might think it's not a good move or... Um, and, and, and prevailing. And even, even, and I'm sure a lot of people have this relationship, it's not even with, with family, it could be friends or, or, or people that come up. People generally don't believe in you. That's how I, how I perceive the world. They kind of want you to screw up so either they feel better about their screw ups or, or um, you know, they're going to, essentially, they, we don't enable each other, we don't help each other. This, this is, What's so great about this project? Like, you, you need some kind of way of getting in and people to say, it's a crazy idea, but just go for it, or learn the craft. And I didn't have that, you know? I had a lot of people that were basically saying, nah, it's a bad idea. Like, go get a job. Like, stay at the, the seafood department at the supermarket down the street. Like, that's, that'll, for now. And then, you know, go to college, and then you get, but you have to push away those, voices and but you have to respect the people that love you enough to try to protect you while also doing your own thing i think that's that's important i think for me um now you done started me i'm like don't want to get picked on <laughs> but, um for me i think my, my hardest obstacle was letting everything go and starting back over again. Um, it was about eight years ago, about eight, eight, like eight, nine years ago, I left the music industry straight off of a Grammy with uh, Jay-Z from On To The Next One. And I wrote that song really meaning I was on to the next one. I was on to the next chapter in my life. I didn't, I didn't like none of the rules in the music industry. I don't know who agreed to all of the different rules in the music industry. And it, was, it felt like I was fighting a battle by myself because we got all of these artists that have the same problems and disagreements, but nobody's coming to the table as a unit to change them. Everybody's just okaying it for the money. And I was just like, but damn, you're such and such, and I'm this, and, and we, know, we know about 10 people that can change all these different things. And we sit at these dinners and we sit at these parties and have these interesting conversations, but then everybody wake up in the morning and go back to their regular life. I couldn't really understand that. It's like, you know, even in publishing, like, who invented the reversion and the music? Who invented the penny rate? Like, like music is making billions of dollars. Like, why should the artist be subject to penny rate? And even in the stream, and no disrespect, I like it, but I still don't feel that the artist is getting, like, their fair share, even with the new model, right? And it's just like, you know... You know, um, and it just, time and time again, it just feels like a new trick being born to trap us. And I just had to step away from it and not accept no music money. I wanted to see how I feel not to accept no money from music because that's what most of us are a slave to is because we can pay our bills and feed our family from this. And I had to cut it off and, you know, go and travel in and start to believe in myself and design and then ended up just doing magical things just because I was just not accepting what everybody else was just accepting, right? And, you know, invested three years back into school. You know, I wanted to educate myself, step my education up more. And for me, it feels great to even be sitting here in front of you in 2018 and you can still have a current conversation about me after I took that risk, after I believed in myself. And I think that was like the biggest Obstacle, but it was the best thing I ever did in my life. So, man. So, for the last, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop on the mic real quick. I just want to. Um, I'm Joaquim. I'm the creative director for House. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I want to say that 
I hope you all know how lucky you are that this group of people came here and was willing to be so real with you. I've worked with some of these people. I love a lot of these people. They're fantastic people, and they just gave you some real stuff. So I hope you all paid attention. I really hope you all paid attention. Um, I want to open it up some questions. We don't got a lot of time. So hands up if you'd like to ask a question. I'm going to come around. You were right up. Stand up. Hi. Uh, hey. Good evening. My name is Ryan Marshall, and I am uh, trying to become an artist. And something, a couple of things that you allude to. Uh, first and foremost, you said that um, if you want to become an artist, you have to um, stick firmly with what you want to do as, as a person and as an individual and all that. And that's something that where I am right now with me as an artist, I'm not willing to, for example, like I'm, lyrics are important. I'm not willing to hop on out of tune and just mumble. Uh, what I my message is important. I'm willing. I want to give back to my community. I want to help people. As a black man, I can't go on a record and say something against my people. Stuff like that. So, when it comes down to big corporations having a mess, having all this power, and you having to, if you want to make it further fold in a sense, how do you still? stay true to yourself because there are going to be people who are telling you you cannot do this or you cannot dress that way or you cannot say this but I cannot if I like I always said if I can think it I can write it and if I don't and if I don't think that personally and if I'm not that person personally I cannot um, present that to the world so how especially being like I feel like a person who I am how do you walk in having nothing, just the clothes on your back and say, okay, fine. Um, or not, okay, fine, I mean, the opposite, <laughs> sorry. How do you step in and say, this is what I'm sticking with this. This is me and this is what I'm giving you. Easy question, huh, guys? I'm gonna um, be brutally honest, as always. Now, if you're an up and coming artist, right, and of course you want to stick to your craft. I never would tell you to change any of that. But, you know, when I look back at it, it's like you're going to have to take some L's. It's going to, you're going to have to take some L's. But this is why I go back to the planning thing because it's not really an L if it's getting you to the next level to where you can, main, you can gain your power and then levitate, right? So, you know, I don't want to give people the wrong information to walk in the door and turn, a, turn away some good opportunities that you could have just handled for a few minutes to get yourself in power and then go to the next level because a lot of people miss opportunities because they're in their own way, right? And that's why having a plan is important. It's like, okay, I might not want to be with this company right now, but you know what? I'm going to build a foundation off of this company and work parallel so while they think they're using me to build something, I'm using them to build something as well. Right, so kind of like find spaces and opportunities where you can build something of your own while building something or doing whatever else the partnership is. And I think that's real important and I see a lot of creatives turning down like a lot of big opportunities because um, they, just, they, just, they just don't wanna uh, change their plans. Hi everybody, my name is Denver Haley. I'm a singer-songwriter producer here in Toronto. Um, I'm a true believer that music is how we love others around us. Um, and I also believe that in order to do so effectively, we have to show ourselves love. So I'm wondering, uh, what are the top three ways that you guys show love to yourself to enable you to be the artist that you are? Thank you. I think like one of the biggest lessons I had to learn was to be forgiving with myself because like determination and 
perfectionism and motivation are like really you know important qualities to have as an artist but you also need to know when to be like yo it's okay like it's all right that this didn't work out and like you're gonna keep moving forward and you're gonna keep getting better because if you can't be forgiving to yourself then the first couple years of your career are gonna suck because you're gonna have to forgive yourself for a lot of shit um so the first way i think is that i you know i treat myself tenderly and with forgiveness and with with compassion for the mistakes that i'm bound to make um i think the second thing that i do is um i try to challenge myself because i think challenging myself is part of loving myself because it's how i strengthen my instincts and my gifts and my tools as a as a storyteller and as a creative um, and sometimes that means putting myself in positions that are uncomfortable because that's how I grow um, and then lastly um, I think like a lot of people get it in their heads that they need to grind 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 never stop never stop never stop and you know, for a period of time, I think that's true, but then it gets to a point where you need to know when to give yourself room to breathe and take a look at your life. Because if you're receiving blessings, um, that's a really beautiful thing. But if you are so busy receiving blessings that you can't be attentive to your environment, those blessings will stop coming. Because the universe is not going to hand you a gift and drop it into a disaster if your life is a mess. It's gonna, if you've been neglecting your space and neglecting your environment and neglecting your energy, eventually a higher power is gonna go, I can't give you this anymore because it's not gonna thrive in the environment that you've created. So you need to know when to stop and when to nurture your surroundings so that those blessings you're getting, they can continue to thrive there. And that's the, that's the most important one, I think. Okay, I got I got, I got room for one more. Where am I gonna go here? Let's see, let's see. Okay, coming in, coming in. A couple more? Okay, Lamar says a couple more. We're doing a couple more. Hey guys, uh, thank you for your time. My name is Chetto. I'm a music journalist. I've been interviewing artists for over 10 years. And the one thing that I'm noticing with musicians, when I, when I look at their story of how they're successful, I'm thinking that there's no rules in the music meaning no rules in music creation, no rules in music business, that everybody has their way of finding their way, and there isn't one way. Would you guys agree with that, yes or no? Well, I can, I'll talk to that. I, I, had, I used to write no rules on my, on my whiteboard in the studio. because I mean, I think a lot of people think like that in our, in our profession or whatever because... Um, that's just the easy way to make really boring, ubiquitous stuff is to fall in line and look at trends and be a, a follower and not a leader. But there's this other aspect to, to music that I always loved, which is that I never, I never really th saw any difference between like pop music and art music. I don't even like saying what I just said because it just pisses me off. And that was, my, that, was the, that was the platform for my whole thing from the get-go, was that I didn't want to be stuck in some lane and that everything had the potential to become something else. And you could move easily back and forth if you wanted to on some Matrix shit. But <laughs> that that's to me is the key and not, no rules in a sort of superficial way of like, oh, well, anything goes and everything's chaos and there's nothing to do. But... No rules in, in spirit, and that you don't look at things in this kind of and discriminate aesthetically or any in any way, is is fundamentally what being an artist is, but not even music. You know, I think it's just a good way to to roll. Hell yeah! Uh, hi, um, I go by the name of Ay Lawson. I'm an artist as well as a producer. Um, one of the things that like multiple artists that I work with, as well as producers I work with, is finding your sound. Um, I feel like with music, we listen to so much music that we sort of subconsciously create what we're listening to at the time. Um, what do you recommend or what do you do to make sure that Wonder Girl's not producing like Boy Wonder or you're just not creating something that 
how do you know you're creating something that's you and not just a copy of something that you're influenced by? Yeah, like I was saying before, it's all about just thinking outside of the box creatively and just going against the grain. Like a lot of things going on now, I'm trying to go in the total opposite direction of, of, of what's happening, you know? So it's even like, for instance, like going back to a story where I was talking to a few of my uh, producer friends while we were working on a track and I was just saying like, yo, you remember back in the days when we used to listen to dance hall out here and the parties used to be like live and people used to, the girls used to dance and it's different now with all the hip hop. So we ended up as like out of fun, just like creating a, a dance hall beat, which ended up uh, being uh, work for Rihanna. And it was, that came from a conversation of something like I just thought was lacking and, and things that, shout out to X back there. Um, <laughs> and like, I just, that came about from something that I thought was lacking within music, like that kind of feeling. And um, just totally going against the grain and taking a risk because it was like that was not happening at the time and that, that wasn't really popular and we just thought to do it. So, yeah, it's all about just thinking outside of the box. Listen to some weird music. Uh, you know, just do something different. You know, don't do what everybody else is doing and try to figure something else out in that aspect of things. Yeah. I, I, have, uh, I have one one quick question before we wrap it up for everyone. Um, we talked yesterday to, to a bunch of designers, a bunch of visual artists and creators on that platform. And one of the things we kind of ended with was um, on this notion of, of mental fragility as an artist and the importance of maintaining your, your, mental, your mental strength. There's a lot of pressure on artists to create all the time to be new. A lot of these questions are, how do I be new? You know, how do I have a voice? Not a, not a lot of careers have to ask those questions of themselves, right? And as artists, it's this dangerous road that we, we, we go down, always trying to think how we have to be new, better, um, different, right? So I think I want to know from as many of you as want to answer this question, how do you maintain your mental, your mental strength? And how do, you, how do you recognize that fragility and kind of either embrace it or what's, what are some of the tasks that you do and, and lessons you might be able to share with the, these, these people in this room because that's something I think is really important. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the mu music is meant to, you know, music is meant to. When we, when we create, it's meant to. And um, how do you maintain your mental? I think, I think mainly you have to focus on the, on the right things. Like a lot of people lose their mental because they're chasing something that doesn't exist, or they're trying. They, I don't, you know, like like a lot of people have like um, obsessions with the wrong things, right? And it's like when I'm in a studio session, you know, the the, the difference from me being in a studio session from '98 to 2018 is completely different, right? It's just it's just a whole different thing, and. And I'm sitting there and I got to see all these different changes throughout the years. And it's funny because like I seen artists when they were in the crowd right here. And then I seen artists when they was on the stage with 50,000 people. And it's like 99% of those artists mental is gone, right? Because they didn't prepare themselves for the success. They didn't prepare themselves for the fake pressure they didn't prepare themselves to be as big, you know, as they are at that current time. And that's why I'm, I keep going back to plan, like plan as if you're going to win and have your goals and, and make yourself rules. Like you need, see, most artists don't have stability, right? You need stability. You need a family. You need people around you that really love you, that really care. Because when you get hot, you're going to get all these leeches. That's not... They're going to do everything you ask them to do, so life is going to seem like it becomes easier. But you shouldn't even want nobody around you that's just willing to do anything for you and not trying to do things for themselves, right? So everybody around me have goals, vision. They have a job. There's no lingering friends just to, like, I'm with Swiss because I'm cool because those leeches end up adding to your book bag, which ends up adding to your mental, and then, you know... I think less is more, if to be honest. Like the less people that you have around you, um, that's not about being creative and doing positive things. I think it's better off to just keep your lane open and, and spend more time with your family. 
That's like the biggest thing I could tell you because everybody's going to be gone. Nobody cares. No, seriously. Nobody. You're going to change sets of friends like a hundred times, but your family is going to be there. Even the ones you don't like, they're going to pop up. At the, you know, I'm like, yo, why are you here, bro? He's like, I just want to give you a hug. I'm like, all right, man, I don't even want the hug, but damn. Right? You know, but just always invest into yourself and your family and a couple of good friends. That's what I can tell you. Yeah. Look at me like that. Somebody else want to answer? Okay. I'll, I'll answer for sure. Um, get help, you know? It's like, you know, there's so much stigma around getting support. Not only is there stigma around mental health, there's stigma around all of the supports and tools that exist to um, support us and to heal us. Like, there's so many different avenues I know in this city, you know, and therapy. You know, for myself, my stability is praying five times a day, but that might not be your stability. And I know that a lot of times, you know, we're told to follow our hearts. And I think for myself, since a young age, I knew that I couldn't follow my heart if my heart was corrupted. And so I had to focus on purity. You know, I had to focus on purifying myself because only when I purify myself am I going to be able to follow my heart righteously because, you know, we all got to align. You know, everything inside you has to align, you know, physical, spiritual, mental. Yeah. That's the poet. <laughs> Also, don't glamorize your trauma. Don't do it. Like, being an artist is so, like, we rely so heavily on, like, the darker parts of us to kind of draw inspiration from, whether it's, like, you know, stuff that, like, trauma that we've been through or, like, whether it's, you know, mental health. Like, because, you know, we take those experiences and we turn them into art, and that's, like, why we do it is because it's therapeutic for us to get our feelings out that way. But don't glamorize your trauma because one of the biggest mistakes that I made was not wanting to get help because I thought to myself, oh, well, if I'm happy and everything's good all the time, I'm not going to be able to make art. I need to be depressed, I need to be tormented. That's part of this whole process. That's not real. Don't glamorize that. Because the thing about light and dark is that light is not a replacement for dark. If you get your, I mean, if you get help and you get therapy or you do the things that keep you healthy and keep you cognizant and keep you functioning, it's not gonna make all the darkness disappear and all of a sudden you can't be creative anymore. It's just gonna give you a supplement emotion so that when it's time to not be dark anymore, you can go be light and enjoy like the fruits of your labor. Like that was my biggest thing was being like, kind of like almost so self-righteous that I was like, no, I can't get help because I need to be dark. I'm an artist. Like, but that's going to kill you. Like, you need, to, you need to have a healthy mind so that you have, a, like I said, a healthy environment for, for your blessings. You can have, you can have both. So if you, if you need someone to talk to or you need a support system because of how difficult it is to be constantly rinsing yourself cognitively and emotionally, get that help because it's not going to make you less of an artist. It's going to make you a better one. That's it, anybody else? You good? Wow, I'm moved. How about everyone else in the room? I'm personally moved. That was super touchy. Um, that concludes the conversation today. I really wanna thank everyone for stopping your lives and flying to Toronto because I swear as you came off a jet this morning, Halsey the same thing, you had a show last night and everybody else you're equally as busy, but the fact that you came to Toronto to share your wisdom to everyone in this room really means a lot to me, so thank you. And I know this was the launch event. Um, it's not a one-off event. We want to do these things very often, 10 to 15 times a year. We built this place for you, so please use it. You know, this is your home now, so please come down. And one more thing, 1.5 million people tuned in to this live stream today, so. That just shows the power of what's going on in this room. So keep the conversation going inside this room and outside of it. Thank you. Can I say one, one last thing before we leave, guys? I want to shout out 88 Glam here. Glam 2 on the way.